Um, so, yeah, so um, we've got the good and bad, good and bad, the bad areas being the bare patches that we're concerned about. And they were soil sampled um, by the three landowners that um, they've got, we've got trials on. So what I thought we'd do is, is go through, uh, everyone's provided some pictures of the site so they can talk about um, what it was like, how things are going now that the treatments are on the ground. And then um, Alex sent me the soil test results from the good and bad areas. And so I can talk you through what we found with them. And uh, that's going to be um, a discussion for each of those sites. But in the process of doing that, we'll understand about how to read some of these soil tests a little bit better as well. And so if you've got any questions, um, let us know and we can deal with them as we go. All right, so the first place that I've got is Alan's place. And so Alan, I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us about it. You'll have to unmute yourself though. Or go sign language, yep. No, there we go. Yeah. Um, so my paddock, uh, my area that I chose is sort of as the block slopes down, it starts leveling out. Um, this is across that area. It's quite flat. Um, it's most probably got some of the better soil on my whole property, but parts of it were very bare, very light in color and had been like that now for oh, five, six years. So ever since I've arrived, um, and further past the, the sites, um, there is actually where somebody's dug a hole and it's just, uh, I suppose best way of describing it, a sinkhole which slowly fills up with water and then has some reeds and that's about it. Um, taking a soil sample, we found water, um, I don't know, within the top, 20 centimetres, easily within the top 20 centimetres. Um, especially with the, the patches that were very bare. Um, so running three sites, uh, a control, and then three variations, one being the common one that we're all doing with the jute mesh and the compost. Uh, one that I did ripping to about 10 centimetres with um, just four tines that are on the front of a box grader. And the other one is literally just thrown on the ground. So nothing, it's not incorporated. It's, yeah, the lime was sprinkled on top or distributed on top, the same as the others, but no incorporation. Um, green manure crop was sprinkled across the top and the compost put across. Um, they've been fenced off. As far as I know, I've had no native grazers, maybe a duck or two, but no kangaroos have been in there. They've got enough feed everywhere else at the moment. So Alan, when you say uh, water at 20 centimetres, so you're saying you dug a hole and there's free water coming th laterally through the soil, filling up that, yeah? I'm literally putting it in a dig stick or the, a dig stick. You could actually sort of pump it up and down and, and you'd have water. Yeah. Yep. All righty. Eh? And and so this is this is at, at at the break of slope coming off the hill as it hits the flats. Is that right? right? Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. Beautiful. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, we'll move into what we found. So. I'm going to go through data and it's the same format for all the places. So after the first one, you'll, you'll know what you're looking for and that's fine. Um, so we've got depth here down to our 20 centimetres and this is soil pH measured in calcium chloride and calcium chloride is used because it replicates pretty much what's in normal topsoil as far as the salt levels that exist. So it's the idea is that when you measure it in calcium chloride, the numbers that you get are pretty much what the plant would be growing in because plants don't grow in pure water. So 
Uh, that's why we use calcium chloride. And so we've got um, up here, we've got the black circles are the bare patches and the triangle uh, is the, the good area or the surround area in the surrounding paddock, okay? So in terms of soil pH at Allen's place, you can see there that um, the good soil uh, well, everything's pretty much, everything's less than five, which we would consider as acid, uh, but the bad soil is, is you know, quite, quite acidic compared to the good soil. And in some cases, you know, it's half a pH unit to sort of 0.25, you know, over a third of a unit in some cases up here. So it's, um, you know, it is quite acidic and, and at four and a half, you know, you'd be starting to limit some of the um, some plants that can grow there and also the type of soil organisms that would exist in that soil. And um, people often talk about microbial activity and soil pH and, and pretty much there's still organisms there, but when you put organisms in extreme conditions, they just work slower. And so they're still functional, but they're just very slow to do what they're going to do. And that means breaking down organic matter and the little reactions that they do. One of the issues with um, soil pH um, is that as soils get more acid, the metals in the soil start to dissolve and they become more available. And that can be a good thing if the metals are needed by plants, but it can also be a bad thing if you get too much of it and then you get tox toxicities. And so one of the uh, metals that we're often interested in is aluminium. And so this is exchangeable aluminium. And that just means that um, it's charged and it sticks to the clay in soil. So it can come on and off the clays and exchange with other uh, nutrients. But as pH drops, the aluminium um, in the soil becomes more available and all the areas in the soil that can hold nutrients uh, we measure as the cation exchange capacity, the CEC. And so this graph is a graph of, of all the places that can hold nutrients, what percentage of those spaces are filled up with aluminium. And so you can see here that the bad soil, the bare patches has a lot more aluminium, like 20%, almost 30% of the places that can hold nutrients are filled up with aluminium in this soil, in the bad soil. And in the good soil, it's less. And of course, the aluminium is toxic to plants. Um, and if you've got places there that can hold nutrients and it's filled up with aluminium, like the bad soil, then you've got less places for the good nutrients to be held. And so you get hit with the toxicity of aluminium, which stunts root growth, and you lose good nutrients. Uh, so that's a double, double whammy. But there's a, there's a big difference. That's a big difference. So to give you an idea, um, there are at around about 5% aluminium. So if you drew a vertical line up through here at 5%, anything to the right of that would start affecting some organisms and some plants would be, would be being affected. So under five, you can get away with most things. Legumes don't like under five, like the rhizobia don't like under five. So the legume might grow, but it won't fix nitrogen or won't fix very much nitrogen. Um, so you need, you need, um, uh, to almost have no exchangeable aluminium for the legumes to be happy. But around five, you'll start to get a drop off in nodulation. And as you go higher than five, the legumes really don't like it. The, nodul the nodulation, the rhizobia that creates the, the, you know, being able to fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere. And then you can get some alumini aluminium uh, tolerant plants that can survive around 10%, 15%. But once they're up around 30%, you know, 25, 30%, even the acid tolerant plants are starting to go, you know, what the hell, this is, this is a bit serious. You know, I can't do that. And that just limits what you can grow and how effective it grows. And you might find that in a really acid soil, what you're planting is being outcompeted by some, some weed like sorrel. I don't know, do you get much sorrel on your properties? You know, yeah. So that's, that's a weed that can tolerate a lot of aluminium. And so it will just out, out compete. I know on, on my place, you know, it, it's the dominant thing because it just out competes um, anything that's suffering from aluminium. Rightio, so that, that shows here part of our bareness <laughs> uh, might be due to that pH and the aluminium that comes with it. And just to 
give you a bit of context as well. Um, some of you have seen this data before, but this is this is a bunch of each one of these little dots here is a is a site, and there's literally thousands of them here, like about two thousand, two and a half thousand um, soil pH and the percentage aluminium here on the y-axis, and so there's a really obvious trend there that once you get sort of below five, the percent aluminium kicks up, um, and certainly you know below four and a half, it gets really quite high. And so that, that's data from all over New South Wales. For your three sites, your three farms, when you throw that data together, it looks like that. And um, so you've got that same trend there. So your, you know, what happens in your backyard happens, it's true for most places in New South Wales. But you can kind of see that once the pH gets below five, that's when you start having problems with this aluminium coming into solution. And certainly below four and a half, you've got, uh, you've, you would class that as a serious aluminium problem. So just keep an eye out. So when you, when you see these, these data points falling to the right of 20, you've got a serious problem. Are we winning? Righto. Um, I mentioned that when you've got a lot of aluminium, you start losing other, other nutrients. And, and one that's really easy to, to lose is potassium. And potassium's useful in, um, in green foliage. So if you uh, have a lot of grazing or you, yeah, there's a lot of potassium in that green material. And if you're grazing, it's not too bad because it goes in the animal and then they excrete most of that out. It comes back as urine return. And so you've got this potassium cycle going through your pastures where you, if you cut hay and move it, then you strip out, you, you mine potassium. Uh, largely as a rule of thumb and a, and a broad rule of thumb, number about five, if you had a vertical line here at 5% of your exchange sites as being potassium, anything to the left of that, you've got a potentially potassium deficient soil. Um, and that, yeah, within, within reason. Um, so this one, you know, it is the bare patches are a little bit low and that might be because they're bare. They don't have green material coming onto it. So they don't have a potassium cycle. And, and so it's bare, whatever potassium stuck on that clay gets kicked off by all the aluminium, that potassium leaches deeper down and you don't have a lot of plant material to bring that potassium back up to the surface again. And so that's probably what's going on there. Whereas in the good patch, you've got more potassium in the system because there's grass there or plants cycling it, is my interpretation of that. Now, I mentioned CEC before. So this is a measure of how many places you have for nutrients to be held. And the bigger that number, the better it is. And um, the CEC, you get that from clay content and you get that from organic matter. So um, really there's no good and bad CECs. It's just the higher, the better, um, but sometimes you're limited by your soil. So, um, now, so th this one, you can see the good soil has got a much higher CEC in the top 10 centimeters, definitely the top five centimeters. So it's got the ability to hold more nutrients in the top, top five centimeters, which is a good thing. Whereas the bare soil, it's pretty gutless. It, it doesn't have much ability to hold nutrients. And you can kind of see like if that's four, well, the good soil has got more than twice the ability to hold nutrients. Okay, so that's a real advantage for it. And in terms of, um, you know, if, if you were to put fertilizer on and the compost that we've added, it's releasing nutrients. Well, this, this soil, the bad soil, it doesn't have the capacity to hold them. So some of those nutrients can just leach through. So that's a bit of an issue, but the difference, the difference is large and you're kind of thinking, well, what, one, it could be the amount of clay that you've got and two, it could be the amount of organic matter. So if we look at organic matter, you can see here that the good soils actually got a heap of organic matter. So I would say that, that this CEC that you're seeing from the good soil, that's driven by organic matter. Now, the, the great thing about that that is saying I can improve my CEC simply by adding organic matter. Okay, and that's what your compost treatment is doing. And that's what your cover crop treatment will be doing also. So we, we're setting this up to, to actually achieve that goal of increasing the nutrient retention ability of this soil by increasing its organic matter. So that's, um, 
you know, it swings around about th those two pictures that I've got there. One is sort of saying that things aren't good, but it's also saying they can be better. It's within our grasp to actually improve that. And the last one for this page is just Colwell P, which is the plant available phosphorus. And, uh, and this is, it depends what you're doing with the, with the um, paddock. Uh, from what I know, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, the, the gospel and all this at all. But from what I know, if you've got a number between, between um, up around 20, so higher than 10, around 20, and you're growing native grasses, things will be going well for you. Um, if you're do, growing improved pastures, a lot more clover, then you want that number up closer to 30 for optimal growth. Um, and yeah, so, I know some people talk about, oh, I've got a native pasture, it doesn't need much pea. Well, they need some and they and up around 20. So the good soil is not too far off it, but the bad soil, it's it's suffering. Okay. Now it's um the thing I like about this project and what you guys are doing, because you've got the compost, uh, you're actually increasing organic matter and releasing nutrients and growing the plant. So you're you've got you've got the ability there to actually release some phosphorus as well. So it'd be interesting to see how that, how that works out, but this is quite low. Like these P values of the bad soil, less than 10, that's like, that's a deficient P soil. And I know there are organisms that like low P soils and, and they've got um, enzymes that release locked up phosphorus. That's true. But like I said before, when you're operating at an extreme, they'll do that, but they do it really slowly. It's not like, you know, it's not the same as adding a phosphorus fertilizer. They just tick away and, and release the pea that's bound up. But in those bare patches, because they're bare, you don't have organic matter there. They're just like their potassium cycles, non-existent. The uh, phosphorus cycle would be struggling as well. So before we move on to the next one, I'll open that up to questions. Have you got anything I spoke about that doesn't make sense or you want clarification or? Jump in there. You can unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can type something. Oh, good. We've got very clear from Christine. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. I think I think you could keep going. Thanks, Jason. Okay. No worries. I'll just. Um... Thanks, Jason. Cool. All right. So, so that's like there's some chemistry going on there. I get that. The next one, um, the next page deals with. The, it deals with soil structure, but it deals with the bits that I can pick with chemistry. So structures deals with the physical elements of the soil, but there are some chemical triggers in there that we'll talk about. Um, in the ideal world that I do not live in, uh, we would be doing this in a paddock and I can show you hands on how to look at some of the structural uh, attributes of the soil. But um, what we've got here, I've started off with organic carbon, which you've already seen, but it's it's related to, this, to structure as well because high carbon soils generally have a lot better structure than low carbon soils. So again, the good the good area of the paddock here, its structure would be better simply because of how much organic matter it's got in there, and that that organic matter is binding particles together to form little aggregates, which are quite stable, which then gives you pores, which allows water in and out. Um, and air in and out too, which is a good thing. Now, I've got here ESP, which is exchangeable sodium percentage. So just as we had exchangeable aluminium, this is exchangeable sodium. So this is the sodium that stuck onto the clays, the, the CVC. Um, and this is saying of the, of the area that can hold nutrients, what percentage of that is filled up with sodium? And as a rule of thumb, Six is a really important number. So if you drew a vertical line at six there, anything greater than six, we would class as sodic. And, and you would expect it to fall apart when it gets wet. Now, we'll, we'll come back to that. But so a sodic soil by textbook definition, if its ESP is over six, you have a sodic soil and you'd expect it to potentially have some structural problems. So here, our bad soil is getting up around there. It's a bit marginal, but our good soil 
at, a, at, at two is fine. That's, that's perfect. So you wouldn't expect that sort of to what we call disperse where it turns into just slush, right? So six, greater than six are sodic soil, less than six are non-sodic soil, which is the better thing to be. And I've got here the calcium magnesium ratios. So this is exchangeable calcium, how much you've got per exchangeable magnesium. And there are rules like philosophies of life that talk about the ideal ratio, which research has shown is not valid. And even the people that pushed it, their work shows it's not valid. But we do know that once you get a calcium magnesium ratio less than two, the soils are not structurally stable. And so there are some alarm bells going here. We have calcium magnesium ratios less than two for mo most of the good and the bad here. And so when, we, when you get soil and you're worried about how stable that structure is, what I'm saying is how does it behave when it gets wet? You might have um, aggregates that you know that they're, they're round features in soil and they, they sit there and between them you'll have pores that let in water. If, there's, if the structure is not stable those aggregates fall apart and they can fall apart into smaller aggregates and when they do that you have smaller pores right and so when you have smaller pores it slows the water movement so infiltration isn't as good drainage isn't as good and a small pore with water in it blocks air movement so large pores are good, small pores are bad. And when your aggregates fall apart into smaller aggregates, you get more small pores. Small pores do hold more water though, which can be a good thing. But um, so aggregates falling apart into smaller aggregates is called slaking. And if you had a, a dish like a breakfast bowl, filled it with water, uh, rainwater, and you put an aggregate in it, and it just start, got wet, but stayed exactly the same. That would, you'd say that would be a stable aggregate and that would be fantastic. Another option is this slaking that I talked about where the aggregate falls apart into smaller aggregates. Now that is not a stable structure, but your water will still be clear. And that just, that's what slaking is. And so that's saying my aggregates, when they get wet, when it rains on this, whatever structure I've got is gonna fall apart into smaller aggregates and my infiltration is gonna be poorer I might get some erosion, okay? And my structure is gonna collapse. And once you get a calcium magnesium ratio less than two, you get that happening. Now, how you combat that, uh, organic matter can hold that soil together. So that's, that's a win for us. And this good soil has a lot of organic matter in it. So I would say that this soil, if you got the naught to 10, any soil from the naught to 10 and stuck it in a bowl of water, it would be stable, would be my guess at looking at these numbers. But lower down in the 10 to 15, 15 to 20, where the calcium magnesium ratios are really low, they're less than one, and the organic matter contents would drop right away as well. And we could see that from the color in the photos that, that Alan took, where you lost the chocolatey brown color and it went back to a sort of a reddy orange color. The fact that it's no longer brown says that there's no organic matter down there. Organic matter gives soils browns and black colors. And so I would suspect that if you got soil from the 10 to 20 layer and stuck in a bowl of water, it would just fall apart. It would completely slump. Now that's gonna be super interesting for you, Alan, because where you did your ripping, if that soil behaves like that, after you ripped it, it will slump back again. The top soil will, should stay the good, but the 10 to 20 will slump and it go back, it'll go back to how it was before you started. Which, you know, so that'd be interesting to see if it does do that. All right, so just, just summarizing, this calcium magnesium ratio, when you've got numbers less than two, you'll get potentially slaking. The other type of uh, instability is called dispersion. And that's when the aggregates fall apart into smaller, smaller aggregates like our slaking. And then they go the next step and they completely fall apart, releasing the individual sand, silt and clays. And the clay is super small. And so it actually floats around in the water and makes the water muddy. And that's, so cloudiness in that bowl tells you that that's dispersion. And that normally happens with a sodic soil when the, when the uh, exchangeable sodium percentage is up over six. 
and and that's really bad when that happens because it takes nothing for you to have a lot of erosion loss um, and all this structure goes and you'll get crusting when it dries out some of you would have seen that in your bare patches i reckon um, yeah so and dispersion the, the answer to that is you've got to get more calcium into the soil and normally it's by gypsum but if you've got a really acid soil lime will do it too okay so this so far what i've got there is saying that the bad soil is a little bit sodic but the calcium magnesium ratio is quite low so this soil would benefit from a calcium addition we've already said it's acid so liming it should do both of those things for us um, now ec electrical conductivity is a measure of the salt concentration and for these um, largely if the number is close to 0.4 you've got a saline soil and and this is quite low and for all your all the soils in this project it's quite low like all these um, axes x-axes on here are all the same for all the, all farms so the maximum this is the maximum this is the most saline and it's not saline all right so you could grow anything in that and it wouldn't care which no no nowhere near is salty enough to do anything bad all right so um now i said that when you get an esp greater than six you can get dispersion the only time that you won't get dispersion is when you have it's sodic but it's also saline because the salts make the clay stick together and so a saline sodic soil has really good structure nothing grows in it but it has really good structure all right but all your soils have low salinity you don't from from what our soils you don't have a salinity problem from what your data shows me okay so alan do you have any questions about what i've got so that's what i've got for each farm basically i've got that data set for each farm and then if you're still with me and you're keen we can look at these things as a comparison of the three soils if you're with me okay so you do get, to, do get to compare against each other, which psychologically might be a good thing or a bad thing, just depending on how bad your soil is. Right, eh? Alan, have you got any questions about? And I can't hear, mate. Sorry, um, took notes as you as you were going through it. So really happy that the soil's not. Um, I don't have a solidity problem. That's a that's a bonus because we're worried about that. Um, and from what I can gather, most of the things that we're doing with the incorporating more organic matter and the liming should help address most of these issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was super happy because it was like everything that we we sort of took a punt on paid off. Like it was yeah. we've done the right thing. Yeah. Um, just to answer Christine's question in the comment in the chat there, uh, physical characteristics of a sodic soil, when they're wet, they're sloppy, like they're just slush. And when they're dry, they're hard like a brick. And, um, and that's a real problem. How much lime that you'd use is a harder question. We, we would, um, the, the industry practice at the moment is to use the cation exchange capacity uh, as a as a guide for uh, so you've got your pH that you're at the pH that you want to get to and then the cation exchange capacity of the soil they're the things that are used to work out how much lime to use and New South Wales DPI have a, a an ag fact which has a little table in it which shows you how to do that um, it's not perfect uh, but it's better than guessing of numbers and I can, if I don't know if Alex has got that, but I've certainly got it, I can send it to her so you can get it there. Um, yep. Right. So moving on, we'll go on to Haji's soil. So uh, do you want to talk us through what the soil is like, what the property is like? Oh, yes. Um, look, this was the paddock where this year, in the last two years, I have not seen any growth, much growth of the any weeds. This year only it covered the cave weed and uh, St. John's curse. But other than that, this was, I have 
plowed for few plowing this field for few years now and i also put at the rate of 3 ton 3 years back uh, lime in it yeah but uh, i never got a success growing anything in this one i tried different things starting from the millets to sunflower and few things and, and um topography what's it like is it flatland or it's a flatland it's a little bit there's a slight uh, yeah uh, running toward one side but mostly it is flat flat okay mm -hmm. And the, most of the soil looks like red and things and, like. And on that treated area, that's on the bottom left of the the, yeah. the screen there, the growth that's coming through there. Uh, that, that's the growth is coming really good. I have mm -hmm. checked today again, and uh, uh, I put three treatments there. One is the standard treatment with the that um, uh, UPRC soil conditioner plus. Jute mat and one has uh, just the uh, QPRC uh, soil treatment and the other one I just did it is I put the just some long clippings in half of the trial yes. and all these three trials I have to scrap the like around five centimeter to take off all the cape weeds sitting there. Okay, so you scraped off five centimeters of yeah. of like just organic material yeah leaf litter and stuff yeah yeah, yeah right so um looking at that photo the thing that stands out to me is um there's um it's quite pale like it's not a dark dark color like no. um so this doesn't have a lot of organic matter in it which you know fits in with being a bare patch as well but that's um that's an issue. And again, one of the, in the field, we could muck around with this a little bit more and sort of see what a, a little bit more detail about what that soil's like. But um, yeah, just to to begin with, you've got you've got some reds down here, so it's aerated, but um, it's quite low in organic matter, and which means that you know, structurally you might have some um, problems because you don't have the organic matter to hold the structure together. Um, Okay, doke. So getting into your data, we can see here that with the pH, we are, most of it is over five, even the bad soils over five. And at the time I'm looking, like I look through this data, it's just like, wow, that's a, a contrast. But given your liming history, yep. it, it, it makes good sense, you know. Yeah. Um, I will point out too that, that you've got this stratified, what we call a stratified you know, these things are curved, they're not straight. So whatever you find in the top, if you just took the naught to 10, you'd actually have an average of those two and it would come out about there somewhere and you'd think that that's what your pH was. But in actual fact, it's quite lower. It's much lower, lower down. Okay, but yeah, this soil's not not acid, okay? Largely because of what you've done to it in the past. As a result, there's no aluminium, okay? So legumes in this soil would be away. They'd they'd be loving that and the microbes to say, so with those legs of the rhizobia would be going happy days. Okay? okay. So that's great. And so this CEC, again, that's all the places in the soil that can hold nutrients. That's not being filled up by things that you don't want, which is a good thing. Yeah. And as a result of that, you've got potassium greater than that sort of, you know, threshold of five for both your good and your bad soils. Still yeah. your good's better than your bad which fits in what I was saying before with the amount of organic matter you've got cycling potassium, but potassium is not a limitation here. So there's a great example of rectifying acidity to get rid of it, your aluminium and then having these nutritional benefits that come from it. Um, even though your observation was, I put the lime out, but it bloody didn't help. I still had bare patches. Okay. But what this is saying is your bare patches aren't due to your acidity now. Okay, there's some other factor for your soil. Mm. The CECs, they're pretty much the same. You know, there's not that much difference. Um, and that, that marries up with a little bit of what you've done. Organic carbons. Now, these are, you know, low-ish. 
uh, the, the bare is worse than the, than the good soil. So that fits with what we'd expect, but they are low and that marries up with the photo that you had of that pale, yep. pale brown soil. And your phosphorus is low and it's like almost non-existent in the bare. Yep. Um, I don't know about your, your phosphorus fertilizer history, if you've used it at no, all. No, I've not used any. Yeah, well, that, that marries up with that those numbers there. So you're asking an awful lot from your soil biota to try to find phosphorus there. So that would be a limitation okay. for sure. Um, yeah, and even the good stuff, even the good soil. So based on that page there, the only, the only flag is your coal P and your carbon and mm. and your I'm looking at that and I'm on ice I'm thinking well you're not going to get your carbon up naturally by growing plants unless you fix your pea so get more pea in the system plants grow more now you've got more carbon and your organic matter content will increase mm. and again I know like if you if it's just native grasses you there's you can't you can go too far with the pea you know, they do respond to, to phosphorus to a level as well. Okay, so yeah, that's, uh, there's a lot of good, a lot of good in those, those diagrams uh, to be seen. In terms of the structural components of the soil testing, again, carbon's limiting. Now, I had six as the rule of thumb here. So our topsoil here is actually sodic, which hard to tell me, like when it get when it rains, do you get a sloppy, does it go sloppy on the surface in the bare patches? Yeah. Oh, it's everywhere was sloppy. Yeah. And when it's dry, it is really concrete. Yeah. Okay. So that's they're they're the physical observations that marry up with that. So we've got a sodic topsoil, and interestingly, and again, if you just measured that as a naught to ten soil test, it would average these two numbers. And their halfway would be about five and you'd say, I don't have, really have a problem. It's high, like it's it's up there, but it's not sodic. I don't have a problem. Whereas in actual fact, your topsoil is sodic and that's the bit that's gonna fall apart and wash away. So mm -hmm. they, so the, the value of those five centimeter intervals pays off. Calcium magnesium ratio. Yeah, there's a lot more than two. So that's a good thing. Um, so here, the structural problems is that sodic topsoil in the bare patches again not saline at all um now I, yeah bear in mind with the salt it can move if you get salt here and you get a lot of rainfall it just washes the salt down so the time of sampling relative to rainfall matters a bit and i don't i don't know i don't know when you when these were sampled in 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 uh, relation to rainfall events at the time but that's just something to be aware of. And so if you suspect you've got a salinity problem, go looking for it um, after a dry period, not after a rain. Okay. Um, yeah, so for, for, for your soil, its structure seems to be the limitation now. You've, you've addressed with lime, even with that lime addition. And, and again, I looked at these numbers, I didn't know its history, but even with that lime addition, you've still got an ESP over six in the surface. So, so um, that's something that we could easily address. Now, we've put lime on in our, in our um, core treatment, our standard treatment, and that lime at pH is around five, is still gonna dissolve and it's gonna release calcium, which is going to start replacing some of the sodium on the exchange sites. So that's the, as that lime dissolves, that data point that's up around eight, it's gonna start moving to the left and, and we will rectify that soil. If the pH was higher, if the pH was around six or seven, then you would use gypsum instead of lime because gypsum will dissolve at any pH. Whereas lime, once it gets around seven, it just stops dissolving. Um, it needs the acid to dissolve. All righty. Jenny your soil. So would you like to unmute yourself and tell us what we're looking at, please? Yes. Okay. So um, we've 
been here 22 years and we run sheep and alpacas here in a rotational grazing system. But when we arrived, this land was completely cleared. We had seven trees on 25 acres and it had been a horse training property and this particular site is where it had been very heavily grazed for a long time by sheep and it has a history of superphosphate being put out every two years by those owners for 25 years. Um, I'd say these pastures are what I'd call heritage pastures like there's a huge diversity of species um, right through our property. It's not like where people have ploughed it up and planted a couple of species and it's a mixture of exotic and native. Um, and I guess, I, just as an aside, we've been learning about Indigenous cultural burning and I'm really curious about what this country would have been like before European settlement and how best to manage it going forwards. And I, so one of the trials that we're going to do next autumn is to actually run a, a cool Indigenous style burn across another patch just to see um, how that, because they keep telling me that that will cause a lot of germination of other native species. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, so this site is at, unlike Alan's at the bottom of the slope, Haji's is on the flat and this one's actually near the top of the hill. It's not on the top, but it's, it's very close and it's a north facing slope and it's reasonably, it's got a fair bit of slope and um, it's fairly rocky. And previous soil tests had sort of shown a pH around 4.3. So we knew it was acidic, but we've not ever put lime out on it. And the other part of the history of this area is when we bought the property, it was had a huge amount of serrated tussock in this area. It was probably like some areas of it were about 50% cover of serrated tussock. So I've worked away at that to where there's hardly any and so in the first 10 years, we had no grazing on it at all. Like there's just no stock apart other than kangaroos. And, and then we've done rotational grazing for 12 years and the grass cover in this has just not come back. So on the photo on the right is sort of showing this sort of very, this is actually good. And this was fairly recent, this photo. And, but it, a lot of ostracyper, uh, cause we've, you know, with the amazing rain we've had this, this spring and autumn and um, so the ostracyper is sort of just patchy about 50% cover and a lot of bare patches in between and the one on the left is uh, our common treatment where we've put down we've put lime calculated based on that pH of 4.3 and then the compost and the jute mesh and you can actually see and the green manure has really taken off and that was I took that photo this week and so the green manure is just growing in amongst the ostracyper and, and there's so much more cover. I was absolutely flabbergasted because I thought we'd done it way too late. Um, and we did some measurements of herbage mass there and the ostracyper bare patches were coming out at about 600 to 700 kilograms of dry matter per hectare and the clover patches right next to them that had a sort of 100% cover were coming out at 2,500 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. So that's you know, a huge difference. So, so yes, yeah, so I guess we're thinking we don't want to plow, we don't want to cultivate here. So what do we do that moves off from the photo on the right to more of, more of what's on the left, I guess. It's, um, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Like it's not a hard sell just in terms of visual, like, you know, I'll have more of that than, <laughs> than more of that. I understand there's a, you know, there's a cost and labor and all that sort of stuff, but it just shows what you can do. Like it is, it is possible, you know? And this, oh, sorry, Jason, just one more thing in that photo on the left, there's jute mesh treatment in the front and then just behind it is with the same thing without the jute mesh. And it's pretty clear. You, you don't need the jute mesh necessarily. Yeah, I wonder. At this stage. Yeah, like I wonder this year because of what we, mm. you know, that's probably true this year, but I reckon if rainfall was a bit more marginal, maybe. Mm, don't know. Mm. Um, the next photo, next slide. 
So what are we, it's obviously a clover in the background there and this is your bear patch. Yeah, so this clover all popped up after, like in the month after we, we tried to peg the um, patches and pick bits where the clover wasn't because it was just starting to appear, but we did get some clover patches into some of our bear patches after. But that bit on the right is much more the problem we're trying to solve. Yeah. And then you've got your soil profile there and, and like you just see the, like the dark colour in that topsoil. Um, so I, haven't, I don't know scale here, but I'm assuming that that's probably like 10 centimetres is about halfway down. Is that, would that be right? Yeah, it was, it was a shovel depth. So it was probably about 20 centimetres. So I think there's about five of that fine silty loam. Yeah. And then there's about five that's like a quartz gravel. It's quite a distinct layer. Um, and I've had soil scientists doing stuff for um, water absorption trenches and stuff for the house. And they've said that they find that quite often in this area around Lake George and they'll find pebble and all kinds of stuff, even though yep. you're up on the hill. Yep. And then after that, the last 10 on that photo is quite a heavy clay. Yep. Okay, but that, yeah, so that dark colour, this thing, looking at that picture, which marries up with the data, which we'll look in a minute, but, you know, that's, that's, there's a lot of organic matter in that dark, dark layer. Um, so a, a chocolatey brown might get you 2% carbon, and this is darker than that. So, you know, you can have a guess, but uh, yeah, it's got good organic matter in it, which is interesting. So this was the bare bit. This yes. is in a bear patch. Yeah. Yes. Which um, kind of says, I mean, I don't know, but it says to me that uh, there was organic matter there at some stage, right? So it's become a bear patch. It hasn't always been a bear patch, which uh, is interesting, which means that you can, you know, if things have gotten worse, you can, you've got a chance to swing them back the other way. Right, so looking at the data, exactly what you said, Jenny, this is an acid soil and, and uh, yeah, so the bad bit is a little bit more acid than the good bit at the top. And that's probably just um, the amount of organic matter that's in that very top five centimetre layer because when you get organic matter return, it's, a, it's an alkali. So the breaking down of organic matter makes the pH go up a little bit initially. And so that's probably why that's a slightly higher pH there um, than the poor. But this is a long way less than five. And remembering all those graphs I showed you with aluminium becoming more available as the pH goes below five and certainly becoming a problem after four and a half. So based on those pHs, we'd expect the aluminium to be horrendous and we are not disappointed. So um, we have quite severe aluminium toxicity. So from memory, Jenny, you were saying that after about 10 centimetres, it starts getting into that clay layer. So that clay layer should have a lot of charge that can hold nutrients, but almost half of it is filled up with stuff that's toxic to plants. So that's a real, you know, there's potential there to be so much better than it is. Uh, and it's just being driven by the, by the pH at this stage. Good soil, yeah, it's better. And that's probably why you're supporting some clover growth in the good patches. Um, compared to the bad. So lo looking at that, you know, soil acidity is a real issue for you and it's an issue of depth. So liming the surface might get you clover establishment. It might get the rhizobia a happier environment to start fixing nitrogen with the plant. Um, but you're going to have like the roots may not actually go very far which is, and so it lends itself to drying out in a, in a spring situation, like in, in the, the season spring, um, because it just doesn't have the root depth. Um, so that's something that with time we can look to address. We can look, look to um, try to, to do things in the long term. And when I say long term, we're talking 10, 20 years to improve that pH of depth. And that just means that we need to lime our, our soil up to about over five and a half in the topsoil. So that with time, the alkali, excess alkali can move down and start increasing the pH lower down. If we 
added lime just to get over pH five to make the aluminium disappear. The problem with that is that that amount of lime to bring the pH over five, that'll work. The aluminium will disappear where the lime is, but it uses up all the alkali that you added with the lime and nothing, there's no excess to move down. And that's why when we choose a higher target of over five and a half, not only are we getting rid of aluminium, but we're putting excess alkali into the system to get the alkali moving further down to start getting rid of this aluminium at below 10 centimetres with time. But it won't happen overnight, but it will happen. Now, those sorts of aluminiums, they're taking up a lot of space that other nutrients could be held on or by with. And so when you look at potassium, they're almost, or well, the good soil is around five, but the bad soil is around two. So this is, this is the consequence of um, having so much aluminium in the system. The good, the good nutrients have nowhere to hang out. And so that you become deficient. Um, and, and then adding into that, you know, if you've got uh, less plant growth, then you've got less like labile potassium, the stuff that's in the organic matter that, that can break down easily. So that's a potential problem. The CEC, um, so yeah, it's a little bit better, higher in the in the good soil. And so that's probably due to organic matter in the better soil. And if we look at that, the good soil is slightly, slightly higher organic matter. And that's probably this difference. Um, yeah, so these sort of differences here, I mean, that's, they're pretty low CECs, which is really interesting because if that's clay, it should have a higher CEC than that, which is, uh, which means it's a gutless clay. So it can hold water, but that's, that's, um, that's, it's not going to hold a lot of nutrients compared to the top. And then with our phosphorus, you, you mentioned, Jenny, this had a history of of superphosphate before you got it, it was like they used it a lot. Is that right? Yep. So you've got a residual P in the system that's quite high. Your years of no grazing would have just had organic matter cycling phosphorus through the soil without any removal. So you just had, would have had a, a phosphorus cycle that's just ticking along, using it up, putting it back, using it up, putting it back. Um, and then as you start doing agriculture to it, you start removing some of that pee out in the animals and the wool or, you know, the fiber that they're making. Um, and so interestingly, you've got here, your bad soil uh, has a much higher cold pee than your good soil. And that's common to see in sites that have had phosphorus fertilizer added your high P areas will always be the bit that doesn't grow grass well. So it's just unutilized. Okay, so um, I actually use coal P as a indicator of bad growth. If you've, if you've got a paddock and you go sampling in different areas, the bits that have high coal P, they're the bits that have a problem because it, the P that you added wasn't used. Okay, but even your good soil, the one that's growing stuff and, you know, is animals are eating it, you know, it's, it's up 25, 30. So it's pretty good. You know, it's, that's a good, bet, good place to be. And even lower down five to 10, it's 10. So lower down, um, this is better than a lot of the other soils we've seen. In terms of the structural side of things, you've got a lot of carbon. It's higher in the good soil. It's not sodic. The bad soil is a little bit high, but it's still not high enough to be dispersive. But that's a check that you can do with the, you know, the white bowls and water. You can check that. Calcium magnesium ratios are all less than two, and that's a problem. Now, it'd be super interesting to see, and maybe Chris or Jenny, maybe you've done those structural stability tests on this soil, but based on, on the calcium magnesium ratio, I would expect that thing to fall apart when it gets wet. But the only thing that might be saving it would be the organic carbon. And looking at these numbers, what I can't tell is I can't tell how much of that carbon is humus, the stuff that's, you know, centuries old, that, that doesn't help much in terms of structural stability. 
compared to the fresh decomposing carbon, which really binds aggregates together and makes them nice and stable. So I can't tell that based on the data, uh, but from what you've said, the bare patches have been bare since you've been there, but they're dark in color. So I suspect they're, it's humic material. And so if I had to put my money on something, I would say if I got some of that soil and stuck it in a bowl of water, it would fall apart. It, it wouldn't disperse, but it would fall apart. So you might have a structural and tell me, does that marry up with what happens? Like the bare patches in summer, are they big lumpy, like a lump of hard stuff or have they got aggregates in them? The bare bits. I think they're pretty hard. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So that says to me, how to improve that is getting fresh decomposing organic matter in there. So the green manure crop will do that for us. So that's a winner. Again, it's not, not salines, we don't have a problem there. Okay, so, um, so your soil is acid, that's its biggest problem and um, needs some fresh decomposing organic matter. Now that liming that soil helps with this calcium magnesium ratio. The lime dissolves, releases calcium. You start shifting all these data points, shift to the right, which is what you want. Okay, so um, just to, we can rip through this quickly because you, you've seen the data before. This is just purely exactly what you've seen, but I've just put the data up together so you can see it. So, um, you know, Alan's property, the bad soil's acid, uh, Jenny and Chris's place, even the good soil's acid, you know, so liming will help there. Haji's already put the lime out. So he's already got that benefit. Interestingly, only this point, only the good soil in the surface is over five and a half. So even, even though we don't have an aluminium problem on Haji soil, I would say based on what I know, we would still lime that because we, we by liming it, we encourage alkali movement with depth. And so we can remove the acidity that's lower down after below 10 centimetres. That's still a long-term soil health benefit. Um, and that's where Alan and, and Jenny, that's where you want to get to, but you're, you're five, 10 years away from that yet with a liming program. Um, yeah, and so you can see the effect of that, your, your aluminium here, the bad soil's quite, it's quite high. So, Aluminium is definitely a player. And I know people, I've, I've had arguments with people. There are some people say, oh, like you don't need to lime native pastures. And it's like, fine, but it's not just about the aluminium, its effect on the plant. It's the effect of the aluminium on the nutrients within the soil. And so that potassium story is big. So your, your um, native grasses that are unlimed will become potassium limited as well. So coal P, I think Alan and Haji, your your soils, you know, there's benefit there. Now our compost should have a should have a P component to it that will be released. I can't tell you how much, um, but we're hoping that there'll be a P benefit, and that's a benefit that, you know, once it's there and it's taken up by a plant, you've now got it in the cycle to be to grow, be released and get put back in. It's a, what we call a labile form of phosphorus. It's not locked up somewhere that it's never going to be seen again. It's, it's in the system, uh, getting more organic matter, more labile P and that starts rolling and snowballing if you like, and you just get a healthier soil. Um, more plant growth, more carbon, more root growth. You know, there's just so much to like. Uh, in terms of our organic carbon, so, I mean, that's a great, great example there where you can see the poor soils need a shift and that's, you know, it's, it's chicken and egg stuff here. Like it's low because you don't have good plant growth um, on Alan's place. Haji needs, you just need organic matter. You need, you need growth there. You've spent your money on your lime. Now let's get some plants really functioning in there. Um, and that's, that's probably your, your phosphorus story, getting pea happening. Um, all right, and then and this is um, that's pretty good higher up, but maybe we need some more fresh organic matter. So that green manure crop is going to be great for us there. We'd expect this gap 
in Alan's CEC, we're going to get a CEC benefit from all the carbon that we're going to put in this soil. That's going to be a, that's going to be a win for us for sure. In terms of the the sodium percentage, it's really hard. He's the only one that's got a, a a sodic soil that would be problematic, and it's only in the top soil, which is great because that's where we're going to you know put additional lime. And then Alan's potentially on that bad soil. But again, the lime should, should rectify that and push all those data points to the left. And our calcium magnesium ratios, um, for Jenny, it's, it's low. For Alan, it's low, you know, in the, especially in the bad. Um, and so again, the lime's gonna help. And I don't know, because I did, wasn't there and I didn't take samples before Haji put his lime out, but I suspect that maybe before he put his lime out, his calcium magnesium ratio would have looked a lot like um, Jenny's or Alan's too. So I think that's that's a post liming calcium magnesium ratio for your soil. So I would I would guess that's a guess, but that's what I reckon. And then yeah, salinity is not a problem based on based on the tests that were taken in this project so far. Um, yeah, so that's um that's nothing to be concerned about potassium basically any soil that was really acid has a has a horrific potassium story to go with it so and i'm not here, here's a good example like if you don't do anything about the acidity there's not a lot of benefit in putting out extra potassium because there's still nowhere for it to go you know it's going to be it can potentially just leach um and so you, you're much better off addressing the acidity get plant growth and i think as that happens you'll get potassium starting to cycle because the potassium would be lower down it'll le it would have leached out off the exchange sites and be lower down in the soil and so you just got to get roots down there to pick it up and you get rid of the aluminium you increase the ability of roots to go grow and get stuff that's lower down nutrients water all right so just in in summary it's basically what we've we've spoken about so alan it's got an acid soil, it's got low, low organic carbon, which is giving you low CEC, it's got low phosphorus, it's got low calcium magnesium ratio, it's got minus acidity. So if you didn't know what we'd done in our trials, you would say that needs lime and it needs some form of, of P um, and uh, we've got to get the organic matter grow, growing to a green manure crop. And that's exactly what we've done, right? So that's that's great. Now I've got super in brackets there. If you weren't going to put compost out for whatever reason, if that wasn't you know possible or you couldn't get the material, then adding P would just would just get growth happening, especially your clovers. You get rid of the acidity, your clovers will, will take off and then you get you're getting nitrogen for free then. Haji's main problem now is structure. Okay, so uh, that that sodic soil in the top, we could address it with gypsum, but given that um, you've got a liming history. I would suggest try to get your your lime, uh, your calcium from the lime that you're going to add to get your long-term pH change at depth. Uh, would be my personal um, uh, opinion on that one. And then getting some pee in the system, either via compost or by by super. And then Jenny, it's acid. Even your good stuff's acid. All right, so. Um, and as a result of that, you've got low potassium and, and low calcium magnesium ratio. So aluminium is the dominant thing here. So we really need to address that if you wanted to improve the soil. And so liming gets rid of the aluminium. Now you've got places for other things. Calcium is going to come into that from the lime. Your calcium magnesium ratio improves. Um, your plant growth will improve. You'll then get potassium cycling and you're in business. You could put potash out. I don't know, maybe there's some K in the compost. I suspect there would be if it's had green material in there. So you're going to get potassium coming through your compost anyway. So again, based on the soil chemistry data, that just your photo of what your treated plot looks like and how good it's growing marries up beautifully with that. Um, you know, that's the value of, of, um, of addressing the acidity getting a plant cycling potassium around the place. Yeah. Um, so of the things to do would be to just check, um, we just need to see how that structure is behaving when it gets wet. That would be, that'd be a useful thing to do. Um, 
and especially Alan who did the ripping just to see lower down that 10 it'd be maybe as things dry out in summer it'd be super interesting to see what difference the soil is like below 10 centimeters on your ripped versus compost incorporated treatments um, based on the numbers i'd be putting my money on that your rip sites are still going to be really nasty hard things below 10 centimeters and your incorporated ones are going to be nicer would be the guess but yeah so um i don't know you've got to humor me a bit i don't get out much and i like soil so i found that i found your data and what you're doing is super exciting <laughs> And, and it was just really interesting and and to see see your photos and hear your experiences and what you've done just marries up with what those soil test results showed beautifully um you know and the only thing that's missing is it'd be just great to get in the paddock with you and and um to to see that soil and dig it and uh, have a look and and play around with it and do some do some physical tests that you can do in the paddock um that would be that would be the next cool thing to do yeah yeah, that would be the gold standard. So I think that's the that's our um, <clears throat> our aim next, Jason. If we can make that happen. Yep. Um, oh, um, yeah. I'm happy happy to help out. Like, it's just a day, you know. It's just a day, so we just need to work out when you want to do that. Yep. Let me know. I'll, I'll jump onto that and get that get that going. Yep. Um. So I I'm just going to say a question from Christine, um, and then I'll invite everyone to jump in if that's okay. Is that okay, Jason? Yep. Yeah, so um, Christine's question was, are there any physical, sorry, are, what are the physical characteristics of sodic soil? Oh, yep, so um, we actually hit that. I think you might've been um, occupied, but yeah, so it, it's nasty. It, it's crust when it's dry and it's sloppy when it's wet. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And um, did you address the issue of the ag fact I might have been, I was talking to someone who couldn't join at that stage. Did you say what the ag fact is or can we type it into the chat panel if you tell yeah. me what it is? Um, if you, if you look at, if you search um, New South Wales DPI soil acidity ag fact, it'll yeah. come up and uh, I can't remember what page it's on. I'm going to say page 11, mm -hmm. but I can't remember. Anyway, there's a table, it's colourful and it shows, um, what your starting pH is and what the end pH, the target pH that you want. Um, and as you, each each row is for a different CEC and the, the number in each box is the tons of lime per hectare required to get you from the starting pH to the pH that you want to get to. Oh, so, cool. yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. So that's there and that's resource and that's what everyone uses. The problem with it is it's designed based on incorporating that lime to 10 centimetres. And so it, my issue with it is that if you're not going to do that, then it will be, you'll put on more lime than you're going to get benefit from because it's not, it's, it's just sitting on the surface. It's not mixed in 10 centimetres. So you can probably get away with less and get the same result in the short term if you're, if you're not going to incorporate it. All right. Yep. So um, I think I've found it. So I will, um... I'll pop that into the chat function now. Um, and um, I, I think I'd just like to open it up and just invite people to unmute and have a chat for the, for, for the moment. Um, would, would everyone like to do that? Is there any questions from Haji or Jenny or Alan? <laughs> Jason, you commented about gypsum is more soluble regardless of the pH. So why would you use lime to raise your pH rather than gypsum? Yep, so lime is calcium carbonate and it's the carbonate bit that increases the pH. Okay. okay? So the calcium part, I, I always, it's just a passenger. It's just there. It doesn't do anything in terms of pH at all. So the carbonate increases pH. When you put gypsum on, which is calcium sulfate, you've actually got nothing there to increase pH with. 
Okay, so we put lime on an acid soil to increase the pH and in doing so it releases calcium and that's why your calcium magnesium ratio improves and you get a structural benefit from that. But in a sodic soil, um, like Haji's, Haji's soil was sodic in that top layer, when soils are really sodic, and we've got a lot of soils here where the subsoil is sodic and the, the ESP might be 20, might be 30. And what happens is the pHs go really high. They're up around nine, 10, nine and a half, right? Um, because there's so much sodium there. And the sodium actually splits water and turns it into OH, which is the alkali, okay? Um, and so when if you've got a pH up around nine if you put lime in it the lime just sits there and never dissolves at all so the calcium doesn't do anything whereas gypsum at those high ph's still dissolves into calcium sulfate and the calcium improves the calcium magnesium ratio improves the sodium percentage as well you know um, but so for haji soil which even after the liming history is sitting around five it will still dissolve lime at that and so you're going to get the structural benefit from that lime dissolving of any additional lime up until the point where you start getting neutral pHs and then the lime dissolving slows right down again. Yep. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions too about liming. Um, the first one is oh, when we use the table, we did we use that table based on the pHs from previous soil tests and we did apply half the rate of lime on based on what you'd said before. Yep. So, um, th so that's what we did. And I guess I'm now wondering if we're trying to get our surface pH up to 5.5, are we going to need to put more lime on? And is it worth us doing another, just a pH test just to see how it's going. Yep. Uh, I guess so, we... so a couple of things with that, Jenny. So um, is it worth doing tests? Like, yeah, sure it is, right? Because tests are great, right? But um, pH, it costs $10 to get it that done in the lab, mm. right? So it's not a huge cost. But um, if take the plants out of the system, that pH test would just tell you, what did my lime addition do for me, right? Hmm. The thing is with our treatments, because we've got compost there and we've got a green manure crop, we've got more organic matter. We, we'll, we've actually got more alkali in the system at the surface from that organic matter that we've added and we've created. So um, I would wait probably another 12 months from now before I would test the pH again in those five centimeter intervals. Um, certainly in the naught to 10, uh, just to see see what it is. But you, you, you know, doing it now would be a bit premature because okay. you're not going to get the benefit from the organic matter that's that's growing. You want that being decomposing. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the other thing that unsettled us a bit is after we set these trials up, I went to field day that Helena Warren ran at her place and she'd done some liming trials and she was doing them at the full rates on and her pHs were quite similar uh, the, the full rate liming rates are on their table and she's actually achieved so they limed up to to try and achieve 5.5 and the lime has gone penetrated down into the soil really quickly in in a couple of years it was down to 20 centimeters and that's when we thought oh maybe we should have put more lime on to so, start with. So so I guess I got uncertain at that point about whether we'd used enough lime or not. Yeah, so um, I guess what I'm saying is is, cons <laughs> is conservative and correct, right? Mm -hmm. If you put, and, and I've seen this has happened, people, um, they put the whole lot out. I've never been on your property, but you describe it near the hilltop. You imagine putting that out and then we do, you know, how much lime will you still have in your bare patches now, do you reckon, with the rainfall that we've had and everything? Do you reckon it would still be there or do you reckon it would have washed? Like, that's the problem with putting too much lime out and, and waiting for time. Like, and so Helena's property, I've never been at either, I don't know. But if it's flatter and doesn't have an erosion risk, 
then you can get away with that. And if it's coarse structure, then maybe some of it washes down a little bit more. Or it's got better aggregate stability. You're able to get you know, a bit of line washing through. So it's a little bit, you know, it might be a bit site specific, but I always mm -hmm. get worried putting higher rates of lime out where there's a risk of erosion. If there's no erosion risk, then yeah, you've got it in the paddock, it's still in the paddock and it'll do what it's gonna do and get to where it needs to get to eventually with time. But if you had a property and you're trying to manage a property, there's probably better other places that could have done with that additional lime that's sitting at the surface undissolved because the pH is too high now at the surface where the lime is, that would have been benefited from that lime. And so I guess my smaller rate more often allows you as a manager to go, you know what, I want this bit improved, I want that bit improved, and then I'll check it through time. Oh, this bit, I need to bring it up a, get, a bit rather than going, all my eggs in the, on this basket, yeah? Um, but yeah, so I, I, would test, I would test next year uh, and then use that as an indicator of how much lime you're gonna add again. And when I say pH five, that's not the target, that's your minimum threshold. So once the pH gets down to five and a half, that's your re-lime re again, okay? Mm. So in the ideal from what we've seen, you don't want the pH getting below five and a half because any lime addition that you add on, once it gets below five and a half, that, that lime's getting consumed and it's not where you put it and it's not doing benefit lower down, if you know what I mean. Oh, and someone's asked about how we put lime out. Alex is doing things. Um, I've actually bought a little lime dropper cart that with, and does a little bit of scarifying. I'll actually post a bit of video of it. Um, we didn't put the lime out that way, but that's how I'm going to put it out elsewhere because here we were just supplying lime in a very small patch and had yeah. to be precise. But um, it because it's quite hard to get lime in contractors, especially if you've got small paddocks, they don't like it. So we've basically got something we can tow behind our, our right on mower and it just drops lime and you can put 50 kilograms in at a time. So you can, so we'll see. Yep. Yeah. Jason, the other question I have is about the green manure crop. Um, it, at the moment, particularly on the on the part that I've ripped, it's most probably a good 600 mil high now. So I'm actually contemplating slashing it down to actually have some of the green manure crop start putting its organic matter back in. Yep. Um, I suppose my question is about how high do you let it go before you slash it, which would be um, same as when you graze it, I suppose. Um, and or do we just wait until it naturally dries? So I'm not a, not an expert in this at all, Alan. But um, my very limited experience with green manuring, we always terminate or slash it um, as it flowers. So just at flowering, because it you know plants change once they go reproductive. They start putting everything into their, their seeds. So. Um, and they, they get a bit sort of, um, you know, a bit more sort of fibrous, you and click, you know, um, whereas when, before flowering, it's all about vegetative mass. And so that's normally the trigger. I don't know how that fits with, obviously um, the unknown in that is what the weather's gonna do and how long you have rain for and before it gets stupid hot. And, um, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I that's what I'd say. I don't know if that is any good here. No, that helps. Mm. I think that makes sense. Um, Alan put his in before Haji and I did so like at the right time and we we're a bit late, but um, it's still doing something which is exciting. Yes. I'm actually amazed that you can just put seed out on top of a bare patch of pasture and not do any cultivation or drill it in or anything and and just that bit of compost on top and it actually germinates this year mm. Mm. so my my three plots i mean the one where i just put it out and threw the compost over the top 
with the line, I mean, it's most probably the least height out of the three. Um, the common one where we try to incorporate the line um, without a lot of success because of how hard the soil was, um, it's most probably the medium height. So it's, it's up most probably around the 300 mark, 400 mark at the moment in mills high. The one where I ripped, um, I can't see my 500 mil cage at all. Mm. So you can see the three distinct plots and the three distinct heights of so, the green manure crop. So Alan, when you ripped it, did you put the compost down and rip it or did you rip it and then put the compost on top of it? I put lime, ripped it, then threw the seed across then through the compost across. Yeah, so right. I didn't incorporate the compost and I didn't incorporate the seed. So it was just literally lined and ripped. Yeah. And then the other two added on top. I must admit I was good. I was fortunate. I mean, it rained about three days after I put all the seed out. And, and not enough to wash it away, you know, like it was, well, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a little bit of washout in the jute mesh one, but not super bad. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I mean, uh, traditionally we always said, look, if you if you do those aggregate tests and the soil slakes or disperses, then don't rip, right? But I'm thinking, I wonder, maybe the benefit is when you are rehabilitating a site, that ripping even if you know it's going to slump again, it's just enough to loosen things up to get that initial spurt of roots through there. And even if even if you get slumping after that, it's it's softer than what it was beforehand. And that's just enough to get a, a win. And really the only negative would be the cost involved and any erosion potential, you know? Um, yeah, cool. That's, uh, that's really good, we, thank you. Yeah. We did a test patch with ripping as well and the rips are about mm, probably a metre apart and they're not very deep, probably 200 because the neighbour just did what they could with a tractor. And so we did ripping and then I kind of limed along those rip lines a bit on the surface, but more on them. And then I put green manure, so no compost. And that's that's been a lot of germination there too. Yeah. But your, your so. ripping, Alan, was it a, a single tine or was it a, a multiple tined implement? You're muted again. Still muted. You're going to have to dance. <laughs> okay. Yep. So I've got a little <laughs> grader I use to do my driveway. And it's got four tines at the front. And at maximum depth, they're only going to do about 10 centimetres. Oh, okay. And that's what I used. So in a 1.5 uh. 1. 5 metres... I did four rip lines. Yeah. So you wouldn't have ripped below 10 centimetres. No, it was so only you, down to about 10. So you are still you are still in your organic layer. Correct. Yeah, right. Okay. So it's, yeah, right. All right. Well, that's, yeah, that's cool. That's good to know. Yep. So I just encourage you all to take photos and your measurements and stuff as you go. And your photos, like put some form of scale in there, whether it's a boot or a foot or a shovel or some, some known thing that you've got that doesn't change if it's a cold day. Um, you know, it doesn't get shorter. But uh, so, you know, you've got a historic record there because and like I had this discussion with some of you before, but what you're doing is is novel. And from a science point of view, like you're trying things that we would never we'd never get the money to 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 establish you know replicator trials and do it blah 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 you guys are doing it you're trying your own ideas and your own property so just record as much of it as you can because i reckon i just think it's a really good story and it's and it's um land manager driven innovation you know and that's um we can capture that and i can see whether it's one of one of you or Alex um, presenting this at, at a like a soils conference, agronomy conference type thing, and just putting it out there because it 
nothing nothing here's gone wow that's just rocked the boat it's not what we thought but it's 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 um it's just reinforcing what the science is saying but you're actually doing it and you're testing it in the field and like alan your observation with the ripping you know just a simple observation like that could be the different it could be a 20 percent increase in the effectiveness of what you do which is a message that needs to get out there so I, i'd be we really need to look for ways of getting the message out there to other people about what you're doing and having pictures to show to demonstrate the differences is a real win because uh, a thousand words and all that sort of stuff you guys know that yeah we're trying to write stuff on a blog on our website about it but yeah we're, it's just trying to keep up <laughs> with, with publishing it but yep. there's a whole lot more that should get up there in the next few days um photos bits of video and stuff yep yeah any other questions let's check the chat that's all posted the link to the bear patches um demonstration site oh okay i think i i think i did get all the questions um, I was, so I think we may, we may well be there other than to say, I didn't acknowledge that we've um, received funding from the National Land Care Program um, and we do thank them for their support. So that their, their funding is actually helping make all of this happen, which is wonderful. All right, so Alex, you'll, you'll work with me and we'll find a date I'll be able to come over and we'll do something in the field with everyone. Yes, yep. definitely. Yeah, right. that would be awesome. I will yep. do that. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. That, that was wonderful. And thanks to everyone um, for joining us. Um, if you want to type your feedback into the um, chat box, you can and we'll capture that. Um, and thanks so much for your time, Jason. It was, it was a really great um, uh a really great session I really appreciate it no worries thanks for having me everyone and um, uh, for allowing me to be involved in what you're doing it's great and uh, if you've got any questions I'm a 24-hour thinker so 24 hours after event it's just like oh I should have asked whatever or how does that work um, so if if there are any of you like that um, and you want to get in contact like um, whether Alex if you want to give them my my email or whatever it's I don't mind or if however you want to do it but um yeah just fire me questions that would help yep and I'm, I'm more than happy to coordinate that so if you want to fire me questions um to jason I, I will most definitely put them together and forward them on um as a block and then they could also form part of our record which is which is really great and useful for everyone because we can actually put it into our um into our blog posts um, and also, you can also email me your feedback, but also um, any of the um, any points that you um, that you took away from today, because they're bound to be different to mine. And it's really interesting to hear and see what you think is important or, and what you want to learn more about too. So thanks everyone. Thanks Jenny, Haji, and Alan for all the oh, hours and hours of work you're putting in behind the scenes. Um, it's it's awesome. So thanks so much. And I think you're leading the way and really showing um, people that um, these small things that you, well, small things, from little things, big things grow. And I think that that's what's happening here. And, and also just to add to that, like I've got small acreage and, you know, there's a community of us here around Wagga and I've, I've been on a property where the person says, I've got all these bear patches and, you know, what am I going to do? And it was just so beneficial. I was able to share like your experiences with them. Um, and so, you know, you're already having an impact yeah. off outside of your area, you know, so that's great to see. Yeah. So, yep. Well, all right. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, no everyone. Cheers. Jason, very useful. Yeah, Thanks, Alan. thank you. It was just amazing. Gonna, I'll, I'll hang up now, guys. Thanks, thanks so much. Okay. Righto. Cheers. Bye, people. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.